Hello everyone, this is uh, Amir Mohammed. I'm a um, uh, GI medical oncologist and director of neuroendocrine tumor at UH Seidman Cancer Center. So it's my pleasure to join my colleagues today. Let's wait for a man. The first question is about uh, rescue shots, the short-acting uh, octreotide. So is it better to administer octreotide uh, rescue shots on a regular basis um, as needed when symptoms occur? Yeah, I can take that one, I think. Um, so typically, we adjust the doses of the long-acting. Sometimes, you know, your doctor and yourself can make a decision to uh, sometimes we give monthly shots. Sometimes there are some increased doses, so maybe that'll improve, improve your long acting. But if you need to take a short acting, depending upon your symptoms, be proactive. I think if somebody has, uh, uh, let's say, that uh, 20 bowel movements, but they still struggling, uh, I would say are flushing. You know, we would say three times a day, or you know, uh, four times a day. But I think sandstatin works very well, but again, you've got to be really pre pre preemptive. But uh, as I said, uh, sometimes we don't want to chase the symptoms. Uh, if you want to be really want some comfort, I think probably uh, it's okay to, um, you know, what happens is most of the time this long-acting uh, sandostat norlandriotide uh, vein off. I have a patient actually, I can say, uh, she can't wait to see me uh, starting week four, uh, week, uh, week three because the, the drug is going to, so that's a, having said that, I tell whether we can move this uh, uh, drug to every three weeks or increase the dose. There is some data about increasing the dose, but not a lot of insurance companies doesn't approve those things, but we have to struggle. Uh, we, I call all the time insurance company, why it need to be done? But I think having said that, uh, you know, you can take it, uh, you know, uh, usually we give about three, four times, but. Uh, don't be shy of not taking it. It's inconvenience, but you got to take it to be improve your quality of life. I'll have uh, Dr. Chauhan make a comment. Yeah, I completely agree. Can you hear me? Sure. <laughs> yes. So uh, basically, it's the same type of drug, right? It's a short-acting form, and uh, the idea behind giving once a month formulation is to kind of keep the symptom under control for most part of it. But we do understand that there are some variabilities and there'll be the bad days where you do need some additional help, right? And these short acting or rescue shots help us in those scenarios. Um, and and they've been, t back in the days, I mean, this is going back when my mentor, Dr. Lowell Anthony, was uh, in training in Vanderbilt. They studied various doses of these short acting doses, and very, very safe, even in much higher doses. But usually 100 to 200 micrograms, um, up to three, four uh, times a day is very safe to be, to be taken in addition to the monthly shots if there are symptoms. Uh, recently, there was another, formula, uh, another product called Benfizia Pen, uh, which is basically a short-acting somatostatin analog. And it is sort of uh, an auto-injector pen that uh, a lot of patients who have diabetes or no patients with diabetes uh, it's uh, formed in the same lines, you know, it's very easy so patients don't have to draw, uh, you, know, uh, you know, an injection or store them in the fridge. You can st uh, store it in a room temperature, it's very easy to administer. You can, it's a, basically a small pen and you can just click it and get the shot. So they've tried to make it as convenient. I know there was some shortage, I don't know if it's back on, but can be very easily combined with the long acting or monthly shots. I agree, be proactive not reactive, but these uh, short-acting medicines are definitely helping uh, uh, there in those, uh, in, in, for the rainy days. Okay. I would also make one comment. I think uh, this is an important point, but talk to your doctor and then make adjustments. Sometimes uh, we see these uh, uh, patients uh, with the neuroendocrine tumors a little bit more, not like every month, but just communicate with the doctor. Our nurse actually will give the shot. <laughs> Uh, that's how I get all the scoop from my patients, and I call them back. Hey, you didn't tell me this. Uh, so the uh, thing is, and we also have other things like, uh, you know, Zermelo, or a lot of times I have a patient doesn't take Imodium as it's supposed to be, 
but you, you be careful and read the between lines and do it everything i know it's a kitchen sink uh, when symptom control but i got to you got to be a good quality of life everything and also another thing is we, we need to have a multidisciplinary team why you know, maybe we have a, a tumor which could be potentially uh, resectable maybe you need to see a, a rather than taking all the medicine but maybe see the surgeons and see whether uh, which potentially they could do something about you know taking it out sometimes it controls the uh, symptoms so think outside the box sometimes so the second question is can you quantify high versus low serotonin levels I'm not high low. yeah i'm not sure i really understand this question oh, okay dr how this would be a good question you know along in context with tumor bulk as well uh, how do you quantify uh, serotonin and then maybe also delve into a little bit of surgical like you know how do you quantify high bulk disease or low bulk disease well I mean serotonin levels can be measured in the blood so we follow that in most of our patients so you can see you know what the level so it's, it is quantifiable with a with a radio immuno assay as far as uh, you know when we do debulking often you might see a serotonin level of like 2000 or something and it might go down to 200 or 600 or something after surgical site reduction. Serotonin levels correlate with symptoms to a fair degree, um, but it's not perfect. Uh, these gentlemen talked about eating nuts and avocados and various other things that can, can make that test unreliable. So uh, that's why we look at three different markers, but again, that most people don't really do that. Yes. Um with regards to specific number, please don't latch on to a specific number because there's so much variability from patient to patient, from day to day, from the state of the, state of the disease, and even emotional state, okay? What we do want to know is overall trend of where these biomarkers are heading. Uh, some big numbers to worry about uh, and, uh, are 10 times upper limit of the normal, right? or five times the limit of the normals. Anytime beyond that, I start getting worried. Anything below that uh, doesn't often uh, worries me. It worries the patients, so I have to kind of allay their anxieties a lot, especially chromogranin is very notorious to being off. Drugs like antacids, PPIs can cause them to be elevated. So just be cautious that, that uh, mild elevation is not usually of concern. It's the larger trends in the disease uh, over months or years, okay? Certainly for serotonin, I would say anything above five times the limit of the normal. Uh, definitely above 10 times the limit of the normal um, gets my attention and we need to kind of look. I just want to add one point. You usually try to get definitely, as he said, the plasma 5-HIA or the urine 5-HIA, which is more accurate than the serum serotonin by itself. And also want to make sure that you take the list from your oncologist about what type of medications and diet you need to avoid at least seven days before the test. Because that will definitely impact the results of the test. So the next question is, uh, what is the long-term effect of Y90 for patients who have liver meds? I think they're asking about the long-term complications of Y90, and that's really going to affect the choice of PRRT in the future or not. Well, you know, we, we used Y90 early on was the only thing that was available, and uh, it, it's nephrotoxic, so I think the, the biggest thing that you see is uh, kidney dysfunction or failure. Um, it's thought that it was thought originally to penetrate wider than lutetium, but I think, you know, because its side effect profile, especially with the kidneys, and both affect the bone marrow as well, um, you know, it's kind of fallen by the wayside and lutetium's taken over. And, and as you hear this afternoon, they're promising new agents with alpha. Um, but that, that's the biggest one that I've seen in quite a number of patients who've had it. Yeah, I concur. I think we are using more and more of PRRT nowadays. But previously, um, because of the, it's easier for interventional radiology, but not lack of availability to travel to different places, not everybody can afford to go two, three hours, or maybe a, out of the state. But now, widely available period, we are using it first. But uh, again, uh, y this could cause some, uh, um, you know, scarring of the liver sometimes and some untowards. But we use them. Uh, but, in, you know, it has to be in a multidisciplinary uh, setting. And, you know, people have 
uh, need a surgery or, you know, though we need to think about how much of the liver damage you could cause. But it's, it's not anything that we see on every day, uh, every patient, but again, that's something to be think about. I, I think it's important to draw the distinction between Y90 PRRT, which is what I was talking about, and Y90 radio embolization, because that is the agent that's used for when they do embolization with an isotope. And that's a different side effect. Uh, pa patients are thought to get more cirrhotic changes. And so there are some, th there's a lot of disagreement in this. And I don't think medical professionals agree that if you get Y90 radio embolization, whether your liver will be damaged enough where PRT will be dangerous, but other people think that the two together will cause cirrhosis. Um, yeah, it's a it's a area of debate. Um, so just to kind of give a little context, um, one of the ways we tackle disease, if it's liver only disease, is called embolization or local regional therapy, where we sort of target the tumors via their vasculature. We either block the blood supply there through beads, bland beads, or beads which elude some chemotherapy locally in the tumors. And the third type is Y90, which is radioactive beads. So they're causing tumor damage because we are giving radioactive beads directly into the tumor and they're radiating from inside out. Now, there's been no study to date done in a prospective, randomized way, which has shown that one form of embolization is better than other. There's some emerging data that some types might be a little bit more toxic, but there's no definitive prospective randomized study that Y90 is better than bland versus bland is better than, uh, so they're sort of equal. Now, the game has changed a bit since Lutathera came into the picture, since his FDA approval in 2018. We have a radiopharmaceutical drug, which is now known to slow the tumor down significantly. So the idea is that if we have an approved treatment, and most of our metastatic neuroendocrine tumor patients at some point of time during the disease course would get Lutathera because it is an important treatment for us, we are trying to limit the prior exposure to radiation. Uh, but this is just a pure theoretical risk at present. We don't have prospective data that patients who got Y90-based embolization before, they tend to do worse with Lutathera or it's an absolute contraindication. I've personally seen patients with uh, liver cirrhosis, like Dr. Howe was mentioning, uh, several years after Y90-based treatments. Um, Previously, there were no PRRT or access to PRRT in the United States, so patients got a lot of uh, local regional therapies, and many of them also got Y90-based therapies. So um, th it is a known complication in some patients, not all patients. But at present, it's a theoretical risk. Um, there was a recent publication which suggested that in short term, Y90-based embolization is safe. But what we are concerned is a long-term safety profile, and there is no data. So at our center, moving forward, we have stopped doing Y90-based liver-directed therapy uh, because there is no clear data that Y90 is superior to others. And we also now know that PRRT is one of the mainstream treatments, so we want to limit radiation exposure to the liver. Okay, so uh, what is the long-term side effects of Afinitor, which is Everolimus, and when you would take a patient out of Afinitor? Yeah, so these are some of the drugs without side effects. So typically, I mean, most of the time, for example, uh, you treat patients, so you could treat uh, forever as long as it is working. But again, if you have this uh, mouth source and uh, blood pressure issues and some of the fatigue, all these things. I mean, you have to think about uh, not fits one all, but we usually use different doses, 5, 7.5, or 10 milligrams. Some people tolerate very well, but I think people doesn't have side effects. We usually continue them. Uh, you know, on other hands, at a cap tem, we usually use for a year and then give a break. Uh, the, the, those, uh, there's not a study looked at what happens, but in the Affinitor trial, I think they have used it until disease progression. So there's no one size fits all, but we have to talk with uh, our patients about uh, what is the pros and cons of stopping a therapy which is working. But if somebody has really bad fatigue and required like uh, 
two naps, three naps, and not functioning, I would definitely give a break. And you know, sometimes I always say, a drug holidays is fine, you know, uh, but I think as long as they're not symptomatic or their disease is under control. Uh, yeah, so it's an it's a individual basis, but we can't, but you could continue as long as you want, but uh, sometimes you have to take into consideration what are the side effect profile quality of life. These are not, uh, you know, free lunch. Uh, so I typically continue. If somebody's on a it is working, it's not a big problem, but again, if somebody's having, but there's no time period like one or two years, but we use it for uh, uh, side and Temidar. We usually, I usually give a year and a stop at that point if things are under control, or if there is a down regulation, we have tumors shrunk quite a bit, and we sent to Dr. Howard, uh, uh, one of the surgical oncologists. Okay. How many times you can do safely PRRT? And how many times have someone you have known done it? I know that uh, this is a loaded question. Usually only once. Uh, it won't be approved by insurance, but I think there is a study going on, ongoing right now. Uh, more, I think, Chauhan can talk. Yeah, um, so as of now, FDA-approved label states that we can use it once. And one course comprised four doses. Each dose is given an IV every two months. However, there is a lot of data from Europe, to be precise, at least 30 different institutional studies, which has shown that patients can get PRT beyond four doses, and it is safe and also effective. However, all these studies are what we call retrospective studies. So patients were already treated, and then the doctors went back into the chart to see. So when we do retrospective studies, there are a lot of biases. We could be filtering or weeding out patients who didn't do well, and you know, so there's a lot of, uh, so last year, a uh, neuroendocrine tumor community in the United States thought there is an urgent need to study, uh, can we safely redo PRRT? Because imagine a scenario, patient got lutathera or PRRT and did great. Tumors were stable for three years. Not an uncommon scenario. But then slowly starts progressing after. The intuitive thing would be that the patient would ask, Doc, I want the same treatment again. I had a great three years of disease stabilization and tolerated very well. Can I do it again? So to fill that need, uh, unmet need for this data gap, uh, there is going to be a clinical trial coming up very soon. Uh, and it's a joint effort between U.S. and Canada. Uh, Dr. Simrangson and, uh, from Canada and I am actually co-leading that study. It's going to be a large study open in at least 100 to 150 different centers throughout the U.S. and Canada, and we will be testing how safe and effective it is to retreat with PRRT at time of progression. We believe that it will be safe and effective based on the, the limited retrospective data out there. We, we commonly tell people you can get it twice. And you know, the first course, four, four times apart two, every two months. But the, the biggest thing is the bone marrow. Uh, with lutetium, it's only two to 4% of patients get myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia. So it's, it's a low number, but that's the risk you're running when you get it the second time. And, but we think that it's safe to give it a second time but you know, there's going to be a higher risk of that, and it probably is not going to work quite as well the second time either. So, we we tell people twice. Just to give my two cents on that, the, the retrospective studies that I man just mentioned right now, they treat the patient that have been stable after the first PRRT for at least a year. So you need to have a stability of disease for a year, and then if you want to do the second or even the third time, everyone only will be two cycles, not four cycles. So the, most of this study only treated the patient four cycle, stable for a year, and then another two cycle, and then they are stable for a long time, and the, another two cycle maximum. And none of this study went over that. Is there any difference in tumor suppression between linereotide and sandostatin? That's a great question. I think I always tell people like it's uh, two tomatoes you buy from, one from, uh, you know, whatever your favorite store, another from Walmart. Uh, so anyway, uh, no head-to-head -head comparison, uh, I think, uh, right now. But again, it's sometimes uh, insurance um, dictates uh, what you get. Uh, but sometimes one advantage with sandostatin I see 
you can actually adjust the dose. You can go up to 60 milligrams, and uh, we're we starting doses at around 20 milligrams, so we have that. But I think there are some studies looking at uh, landreotide giving 240. We have some data about that. But again, the point is, I think mechanistically, there's no huge difference. But I think, you know, uh, people market things differently. Landreotide has advantage. It is not like intramuscular and you can give, and they say that their plunger is better than the other one. I'm not sure. I will buy it, but. Yeah, it's, it's the tomato, tomato. <laughs> uh, there are some arguments in favor of one versus the other. Um, but uh, at the end of day, I, for, from my standpoint, they're the same drugs, whatever. Sometimes patient can have uh, a little bit more diarrhea uh, in the first couple of days after Landria tide. Uh, in, in Sandostatin, the issue is that it's a powdered formulation and there, there could be some clogging issues of the needle. So it's, both have their challenges. Uh, also, there was a recent data by Dr. Reedy from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they, they studied both the injections and the pain scores were equal, so it's, uh, which was good to know uh, because people used to think, oh, one is intramuscular, might be more painful than the deep sub-Q, but turned out to be both were, uh, you know, in terms of pain scoring in a randomized fashion were fine. Uh, however, uh, there was one study done in MD Anderson by Boyd et al. And they, they gave these shots and they did CT scan to see whether the nurses, and this is a trained net center where nurses, uh, they, they, they know what they're doing. Uh, and even in, in their center, they did notice that many a times patients did not get the shot if it was meant to be deep uh, in, intramuscular, it did not reach in the muscle. And that can certainly cause some pharmacokinetics variability, that means absorption issues or the drug level issues. So there is one study which shows that if not given properly, there could be some problems. And I guess that's where landriotide might take a little edge because it is deep subcutaneous, you don't really have to go and uh, necessitate it to be in the muscle only, while sandostatin would work best the way it's supposed to work only if it goes to in the muscle so that it remains sustained levels for the whole month. So that's a little advantage, I guess, for Landertai there, but that's just one study, small study. Um, in a bigger picture, I think they're both same drugs and we interchange. It really depends on patient's insurance and what they're comfortable with. How often you will check 5-HIA? Yeah, that's a good question, but again, um, we typically uh, do it at the time of diagnosis and somebody has bad symptoms, we have to quantify 24 hour. Uh, urine is the better one, but I think people are also doing like spot urine, but that may not be as accurate as your 24 hour. But I think obviously if somebody has change in the status, I usually do it, but I don't do it on every patient every time, but only somebody, we think that serotonin levels are, of course you can check the blood serotonin level, but I think a product would be much more easier in the clinical trials. This is what the gold standard they use, 24 hour urine. Uh, you can check it as many as you want, but I usually, usually it doesn't change, but I usually do when somebody's uh, things are not working, maybe if I'm worried about more about carcinoid, uh, we do check, but again, there's no set time, but you have, uh, you guys do a lot more, but. We, we don't do it, but you know, it's a, it's a valuable test. It's a pain to collect, so. <laughs> okay. The second question about the role of liver transplant. So do the patient that have nets primary has been removed, are they qualified for liver transplant if the patient have liver mets? Yeah, I think uh, maybe Dr. Howe can comment on it, but there are some centers uh, which are trying to do it. I think um, Tennessee and probably Cleveland Clinic, um, they were actually liver only disease, some experience, but I, you know, historically we don't, we don't usually recommend. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's different about neuroendocrine tumors is that they, you know, people live a long time, even with a fair amount of disease. So. Um, there's a big shortage nationally of livers, so they have to allocate them based on priority. Um, so a lot of people can do well for a long time with cytoreduction. 
Um, there are some patients in our center, I only know of about two patients that got liver transplants, and they're young people who had a liver full of tumor where it was clear that they were gonna die of their disease, and, and that was really the only hope. So I think there's a role. Um, but the same patients that do well with transplant, if you look at Mazzaferi's data from, from Italy, are the same patients that do well with cytoreduction. reduction. So their exclusions, the Milan criteria, would exclude most people uh, from transplant. And so not too many people get them. I'm not saying it's not a good treatment, but um, you need to be on immunosuppression. You can't get a liver transplant if you have any extra hepatic disease. That means if you have a single bone met or a lymph node in your abdomen somewhere, you're not eligible. It has to be only in the liver. And if you get a Dota PET scan on people, you'll find that most people don't have just liver only disease. So a quick question for you, Dr. Howe, because I know most of these data are old. Did the ever study if these patients are going to be in immunosuppression, is that increase the risk of recurrence for neuroendocrine tumors? Well, I mean, some of the immunosuppression they use now is an M mTOR inhibitor, like Everolimus, uh, or rapamycin, and, uh, you know, tacrolimus is used currently uh, in some patients. And so I've had the question come up from our transplant surgeons recently, and people were going to get a kidney transplant, but they had a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, and do we think it's safe to get get a transplant? And it's, it, I don't know the answer, but... Um, <laughs> I think like any tumor, immunosuppression is gonna cause increased tumor growth. But maybe if you use an mTOR inhibitor, it'll, it'll keep it down, I don't know. Yeah, I only have two patients uh, who got transplant for their metastatic disease. And if, I think, and I read the transplant guidelines, so the, the data is very shaky, right? So um, it's definitely not my go-to recommendation beyond certain cases where it's liver-only disease, and we know that the patient's going to get in trouble because of hepatic decompensation, and this is going to be a sort of life-saving situation. If we do do transplant, most of these patients would be on mTOR inhibitor. It's a little lower dose, not full 10 milligram, so they can continue to tolerate. So that's one of the, the transplant guidelines recommendation as well, uh, and, and my patients are on mTOR inhibitor. But uh, as a medical oncologist and that specialist, we do not recommend transplant. Um, I would any day opt for surgical debulking uh, because we understand the biology of disease. This is a chronic disease. And transplant comes with its own baggage of immunosuppression, risk of infection, secondary cancers, lymphomas, and other things. So transplant's not easy. And you have to be on a very rigorous monitoring uh, post-transplant for graft rejection of the liver. So, so it's not an easy treatment. Um, so you have to really weigh in risk and benefits. Okay, next question. Should patients who have liver meds avoid alcohol? Does it cause more harm? Does it cause well, more harm? It depends upon how much you drink. Um, yeah. But uh, alcohol, you know, if your bottle is this much, that's okay. But it is not this much, that's not good. Uh, it's a general rule. But, but again, um, you know, one of the problems with uh, what we are seeing now uh, even in general population is like there's an epidemic, or I won't say epidemic, but it could be. Uh, it's a, a you know, fatty liver, I mean, it's an under-recognized NASH, non-alcohol, uh, you know, liver disease. We are seeing more and more, but uh, in general. But I think when you have liver, dis liver uh, metastatic disease and you have uh, resections done, you have uh, uh, some of this Y90 is done, it's already know that uh, there is some fibrosis, but on the top of it, which you're adding, uh, you know, some alcohol, it could potentially cause some liver uh, cirrhosis set up uh, sooner than later. I mean, you know, but these treatments, what we have is not with free lunch, but sometimes they can set up some of the sinusoidal problems and uh, cirrhosis. But again, yeah, I mean, alcohol is uh, okay, but it, uh, it's, it's like a, as long as uh, you enjoy it, not to the point that, uh, of course, everybody enjoys it, but not to the point you get drunk or something. But yeah, I mean, I caution moderation, but it's not like that. We won't recommend it. No, you have to. You can't drink ounce of alcohol, but you know, if it is like um, uh, once a week or you have a party, that's okay, but not every day and uh, a pint of uh, liquor. You might want to take some sub Q sandostatin before you do it. <laughs> I don't know, guys. Everything about 
I think for the patient who have already serotonin syndrome, I always tell them to avoid alcohol because a man just shows that level of serotonin can correlate with tumor growth sometimes. So maybe this patient specifically, I would tell them as much as they can just to avoid alcohol. For how long you can take or be on sandostatin can be in definitive. Um, this patient has been on sandostatin for almost 20 years. That's a great question, I think, but I think we don't have any data. But I think in real practice, we do continue sandostatin as long as it is not a high-grade tumor. You know, as we know, grade one, grade two tumors respond. Uh, we Even we give uh, uh, other treatments like um, Lutathera or maybe other targeted therapies, but we usually continue. But there is no great studies looked at how long to give. But I think because it is something is, uh, you know, we're building other platform on the top of it, you're adding more drugs. So it could be combination could do a better, but we don't have really good answer for this question. But in clinical practice, we do continue. Yeah, the, the right hand rule of thumb to stop any therapy is one, it's stop working, so if the tumors are showing progression and it's no longer working, that would be one reason to stop it. The other would be uh, toxicity, so if somebody's having terrible side effects, which is fortunately very rare with these drugs, sandostatin, landriotide, but some patients can have some side effects. Uh, so if the overall risk is more than the potential benefit, then we stop it. And, um, and those would be the two main reasons. These are what we consider hormone-based therapy. So unlike chemotherapy or radiation, our bodies can tolerate them for a really long time, and we know patients who are on it for years and decades. I think one of the practical issues would happen is these shots cause fibrotic reactions in, in the subcutaneous and the you know, deeper tissue, so it gets difficult and difficult. The real estate is limited, right? So it gets very difficult to inject some, on somebody who's been on it for several years. So there could be some of those challenges. <laughs> yes, yes, so hopefully down the road we have other alternatives, you know, like a transdermal patch or the drug, the pills that we are talking about. But, but the shot, if somebody's tolerated, is able to get it, there is, in my mind, there is no uh, safety issues, long-term safety issues. Uh, uh, these patients should also continue to monitor once a year cholesterol levels, the sugars, the HbA1c's, and other things which we routinely do on everybody. But um, there's no upper limit to how long they can take it as long as it's working. One thing I would add is there is some data looking at uh, you know pancreatic insufficiency with the long-acting Dr. Sa uh, um, uh, Walid Saif and group in New York uh, did some excellent work on identifying patients uh, who has more diarrhea. So one thing I would check uh, somebody who is on Sanosat having more diarrhea is uh, pancreatic insufficiency. It's a very well-known phenomenon, approved, uh, you know, uh, studied, well-studied. So I usually, uh, you know, look into that. But other than that, I think there's rare patient who's dizzy. I have a couple of patients who have problems. I mean, we usually hold it if it is causing more quality of life issues. Second question is about role of genetics. Is, is, uh, is it hereditary, like I think for the small bowel and the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor? Yeah, pancreatic, I think there is some, uh, you know, uh, MEN1, I think Dr. Howe mentioned uh, some of the VHL, uh, you know, genetic mutations. But these are very, uh, very small population of compared to uh, a lot of nets, the amount of the nets we see. We don't send everybody, but if somebody has, uh, you know, uh, parathyroid problems or, you know, they have anything, hemangiomas in the head and uh, some of these things are kidney cancer uh, in conjunction with uh, some of the neuroendocrine, then definitely we send uh, patients to genetic testing uh, for this VHL gene or MEN1, uh, MEN, uh, MEN1 syndrome, basically. But that is very, uh, but there is also NIH study ongoing. I have sent a couple of patients. So if you have a whole family members have more than one family, but that's the, there is a study ongoing at NIH. I mean that's going on for a long time. I usually refer them to NIH. Yeah, we and that's true. So of peanuts, there's a female predisposition. There's only one uh, gene that's been identified in small bowel neuroendocrine tumor families, it, that was done at the NH in a large family. In, in all the families they studied, only the one had it. 
um, we've done genome sequencing on about 25 or 26 families. There's no recurring mutation, so most of the small bowel are probably, well, there are familial clusters, but we don't know the gene responsible. Okay, next two questions for Dr. James Ho. Number one, what makes University of Iowa Center of Excellence for PRRT based on the European countries? Uh, why is it for PRRT, or were you talking about the ENAPS? They, they mentioned mainly for PRRT. Okay. Well, um, and you had a question about, like, what, what makes us an ENETS? Maybe I can answer no, that. No, what's make you a center of excellence according to the ENETS guidelines in European oh. country? So there's only one accrediting body in the world for neuroendocrine tumor centers, and that's the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. That's been around longer than NANETS, and uh, NANETS, we're kind of the little brother, little sister uh, organization, and we haven't wanted to take on accreditation. Uh, but they have a very stringent set of things that you need to uh, document, and that is expertise in multiple different specialties, like about five or six different specialties. You have to show a certain number of new patients per year, a certain uh, uh, and you know, I have to report my complication rates and how many surgeries I did every year to maintain accreditation. So it, it's very stringent. Now for PRT, um, it, it's just one of those many elements. So we're, the ENETS doesn't give her their certificate of excellence just for PRT. They give it for the whole neuroendocrine tumor center. But that requires PRT, pathology, attendance at tumor boards by medical oncology, endocrinology, surgery, uh, pathology, and nuclear medicine. I mean, and, and then having a certain volume. It's, it's, it's very, you know, there are a lot of really good centers. You, you know, you got people from really good centers up here, but to take on that kind of uh, application is very difficult, and um, it's a high bar, but it's also a lot of work. And so even some of the best centers in the U.S. who could qualify just don't have the horsepower to apply for it. The second question for you. If patient three years after surgery has intense of lymph node in the mesentery, I, I think it means intense uptake, does that indicate disease progression? Well, it's probably not progression. It's probably a node that wasn't removed at the original surgery that, that was positive. I mean, it's progression because that lymph node probably got bigger over time. Um, but it was a lymph node that would have been involved and just wasn't removed. So, you know, if you look back on CT scans and it's gotten larger, we would call that progression, as opposed to if it's the same size and it's just a big lymph node left behind, then it's semantics. I mean, and, and then the question is, should you go after it to take it out? And that depends upon, you know, uh, symptoms, other comorbidities that the patient has, and if there are other sites of disease, that would be worth going after at the same time. Okay. If you are taking medications for hypothyroidism and you're taking the cabazotinib, when you go off that medications, will thyroid go back to normal or not? And how important is it to take the thyroid medications? Yeah, thyroid medications are uh, essential for a lot of people, I mean, you know, all this treatment can stop at uh, thyroid medicine, but if it is from the drug uh, causing hypothyroidism that uh, potentially, usually, um, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, there is a lot of drugs available now, immunotherapy, you know, you have and kinase inhibitors, but immunotherapy related hypothyroidism, <laughs> not reversible sometimes, but, uh, but some of the other TKIs could be, but you got to check on uh, TSH and T3, T4 and see how your levels are, but you don't stop it. Uh, uh, and then obviously that need a close follow-up. Uh, but I'm not sure I answered the question, but uh, usually thyroid medicine takes the precedence then uh, if somebody has two problems, uh, thyroid, okay. Yeah, there's not uh, clear data, but I think if you're a hypothyroid from uh, cabazantinib, I think there's a potential that you may need to be on Synthroid uh, for a long time. 
but I think it could be reversible, not that I know off off my head, but you haven't. Yeah, so we've been using some cabozentinib for neuronicin tumor patients under, there's a large <laughs> national study called Cabinet Study, and uh, we're using cabozentinib uh, under the protocol. Uh, I don't think we have incurred uh, the thyroid side effects, but there, the cabozentinibs can have many other side effects. And my experience, yes, most of the side effects are reversible. So be it nephrotoxicity, high blood pressure, proteinuria, and other issues, cutaneous side effects, uh, they usually uh, tone down or completely disappear after discontinuation. With thyroid, we'll have to see and study patients, uh, you know, and the study is still ongoing, so we don't have a lot of data. Uh, but if I have to, uh, you know, take an educated guess, I think your thyroid functions might get better off the therapy eventually. But also, hypothyroidism, one of those symptoms, uh, which is very well in easily manageable. Um, there's a class of drug called immunotherapy, which is uh, very popular in a lot of other cancers. Um, and hypothyroidism is one of very common side effects, and we just treat through it because Treating hypothyroidism basically replacing the same hormone, thyroxine, which your thyroid is making. Instead, you're taking it in a pill form first thing in the morning. Uh, so it's, uh, if that is the only side effect, then, uh, then the potential benefit of the treatment could outweigh the, the side effects, and you just take the Synthroid. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a big likelihood that off the carbozantinib in future, if you ever stop it, that your thyroid functions might get normal. Um, but n needs to be kind of studied in more rigor. So I agree. I, I also treat uh, kidney cancer, so I have expertise with CABO, but I usually <laughs> treat my patients. I have two or three people. Uh, as long as the drug is working, I wouldn't take them off of the drug. I usually treat the uh, thyroid issue with increasing their dose or monitoring them closely. But if it comes to the point, I mean, I never have to stop somebody's uh, cabozantinib because their thyroid levels are up or down, because I usually monitor them closely. I think it's a matter of fact, it's mandatory to check the thyroid every three months or so, and then use the Synthroid. I understand there's two drugs now instead of one, but I think if your, drug, if your disease is under control, we would continue that. Uh, I, I don't think that we do some dose modification sometimes, depending upon, not for the thyroid reason, but if your cabo has a little bit of more fatigue and some of their side effects, hypertension, than we do from 60 milligrams to 40, 40 to 20. Uh, but I think we'd never stop it because it is causing hypothyroidism. Okay, for the sake of time, because we only have five minutes, I will take this couple together. So about niacin and histamine. For niacin, can you give some examples of location of the lash, which is the plagra, which you have in almost 7%, um, and is there any medication you recommend for niacin deficiency? I didn't see in the United States, I have seen several cases in India. Uh, <laughs> uh, but luckily, we don't have, uh, I mean, it's 7% historically. But again, uh, maybe I'm lucky that I didn't see, but I usually uh, look for those things. But it's very difficult, diarrhea uh, and dermatitis. And there's three, uh, three, three Ds, right? I think, uh, yeah, yeah, and dementia. Uh, obviously, you can have all over the skin, mostly in the legs you see some of these uh, uh, unusual skin manifestations, but, um, but I, I, honestly, I didn't see in the last 10 years one case. Yeah, and, and even if uh, those rare cases where we do see this, um, one of the reasons why this is happening is because uh, the key amino acids getting diverted to make more serotonin, uh, so vitamin replacement, multivitamin, but at the same time controlling your disease better right, so surgical debulking, lowering your serotonin, all of that is really important. But it's extremely rare with our food being so fortified with uh, multiple vitamins and especially B-complex. Uh, it's very rare for us to see these unless somebody's uh, been untreated, undiagnosed for a long period of time. Uh, it's extremely rare these days. Definitely, I agree. I saw it in the scalp actually twice especially in the patient with a small bowel, and that's why I attach them with the nutritionist the first time they come and see us in the clinic. Any medication you recommend for the overproduction of histamine? Um, so 
the typical medications used for histamine control are H2 blockers or antihistamines. So these are your uh, uh, Benadryl sort of drugs or Zyrtex, and then the other ones, the, the H2 blockers, which are more antacid, Zantac. Uh, so uh, many of times, either a dermatologist or uh, you know, sometimes even rheumatologists, because these histamine syndromes are very overlapping and sometimes very challenging to treat. Sometimes it's not related to NETS, and sometimes it's related to a condition called mastocytosis, okay? Uh, which is a mast cell or a type of blood cell disorder which secretes a lot of uh, histamine. And histamine flushing is different than carcinoid flush, right? Uh, so histamine flush, actually, if you scratch somebody with histamine problem, uh, there's a phenomena called dermatographia. So there'd be a, the skin would elevate. So I usually write go cats on my patient's arm and it lights up and then this is a more histamine problem rather than serotonin problem. Uh, we get patients sent to us for any sort of flushing or rash, right? And uh, some of them might not be a NETS patient but more a histamine disorder. Then I defer them to an allergist or immunologist or dermatologist. Um, so for histamine, immediately you can use the H2 blockers and antihistamine-based drugs. But then you have to look for the deeper issue, what's going on, is this and, uh, you know, an allergic condition or is it part of neuronicin tumor? Uh, nets, most functional nets are serotonin-related or other, but histamine can also be part of it. Um, 